forest of silver poplar, pine, willow, and covered with old man's beard. So there's now over a kilometre and a half of this side of the lagoon is all planted with natives. There's about 40,000 natives around. So as you can see, all of these things here we've planted on this side. The bracket's come away by itself. But, um, what I'm really uh, pleased about is the number of uh, potter carps that we've put in. So it's just magic. You know? how, long, how long has it taken you to get all this planting done? Um, well, I've, as I say, I've been here um, over nine years now. So this has literally been the last nearly a decade of um, putting plants in the ground. Uh, we've got 31 biota nodes, so that's the little ecosystems we've created. So yeah, I mean, and the lagoon's in behind us here, so it's, it's, it's hard to see, but we've got a couple of lookouts that we're just gonna get around the corner to. Yeah. So the reason to Haitara is so important at the time, or just prior to the, the agreement between the Crown and Te Runga Naitau, there were three gestures of goodwill by the Crown, and they were the return of Auraki Aurangi Mount Cook, Ponamu Greenstone, and Tutaipatu Lagoon. What, what, are, what are the changes that you've seen here in those 10 years? Yeah. Um, well, a recognition that it's of value, and I think that's been the key part of it. People now value Tuhaitara. It's not an old place where, uh, admittedly, we still get dumping and cars and all sorts, but when I arrived here, every weekend there'd be 20 trail bikes, there'd be cars driving through the dunes, there'd be dumping going on, there'd be fires. There's, Whereas now, yeah. it's Two Haitara Coastal Park. We have relationships with the University of Hawaii. We have relationships with, um, we have Texas A&M and Virginia have come here the last two summits. We've got people around the world uh, doing uh, research projects with us. We have visitors from anywhere coming to see what we're up to. How big is the area that you the, the So area? it's 10 and a half kilometers long, so from the mouth of the Waimakariri to the mouth of the Ashi Rakahuri. So, where else in yet? There's a thousand kilometres of coastland in Canterbury. In Canterbury. So it's all the bays and bits and pieces. Only ten and a half kilometres of it are in a bicultural co management trust to Hotana Coastal Park. Okay, so in five years' time, what do you want to see? Well, I can already say after almost a decade, we've got um, 7,000 kahakatea tōtara matai we've put around there over the last nine years, and they are amazing. So in the next five years, I would be hoping to see some of those just starting to poke out through these light wells we've created through the Willow Swamp. Greg, you're a very, you're a very outspoken guy. Is it possible that some of your points of view might upset people? I'm 60. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck who I upset. No, seriously. Yeah. Uh, one of the fortunate things about me is I would never put the trust in a position whereby I embarrass them or I do something that that's not my nature. I am so fortunate to be here. I want one day someone to look at an area and go, wow, wasn't it great what those people did back then? Yeah, I, if, have you been to Putaringamotu? Putaringamotu, Rickett and Bush. Yeah. You go there and you think, I know the Deans were settlers and I mean, there's an element of a, you know, the old school tie sort of stuff now associated with that sort of, but these people set aside this, this piece of record in, and you go there, you know, I, I defy anyone not to hug a card to hear go, wow. One of my favourite writers is Henry Foro, and there's a line of things I've always loved. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation. It's kind of pessimistic. But then when you lie in a field with your feet in a stream, things don't get better than that. You and I both know that it makes you feel good to be around nature. Yeah. Um, and more and more um, practitioners of well-being for the community know that too. So we have people come out here who may have ended up um, not well, they may have ended up in prison, whatever, whatever their circumstances may be, but when they come out here and they see the journey of how you rehabilitate, I guess, nature, it is no different to us because we are, we've got to remember we're not apart from nature, we are part of nature and it's, that's why we feel so good about it, that's why we flock to the sea, that's why we love swimming in rivers, that's why we're so appalled by the state of fresh water in Canterbury. I tell you what, Jerry Brownlee came here one day and I fucking wanted to hate him, I, I, I just thought, you, I wanted to hate him and he came in his suit you know, he had the tie on and all this stuff and his white collared shirt and all of this and 
all of our trustees were all dressed up nicely and we all, and the council, I think the CEO and the mayor and all of them were, we all drove down to the lagoon and, you know, because we couldn't walk down there. So we get out and I was just wanting to despise him, but when he left, his jacket was off, his tie was off, his two top buttons were undone, and he was enjoying being in nature. I can't say I agree with his politics or whatever, but I saw him differently after he'd experienced nature and talking with me about what I like about it. He actually was a different person. And I leaned over and I said, you know, begrudgingly got to say I kind of enjoyed that, so, you know, thanks. And then walked, I had to leave early, so I walked away. And everyone was sort of laughing, but, yeah. but I, I really wanted to despise him. And, but I couldn't. I mean, he's a human. But I saw a wee bit, I think, that if we could just round him up and get him out into nature a little bit more often, he might be a halfway decent human being. Like politics is a, you know, it's an unfortunate part of humanity. Politics shouldn't be adversarial. Like, why, I, I, part of me is sort of thinking, why do we even have an opposition? Wouldn't it be much better in New Zealand if we said, we're going to have 100 seats. Oh, look, you got 50% of the vote, you got 30%, you got 20%. You're all in cabinet. So the cabinet is made up of however many seats, it probably wouldn't be 100, but proportionately, how you got in the vote. Yeah. So you don't actually have an opposition. You have everyone working together to make the places a better place to be. So why would you run for ECAN? I mean, take yourself away from all this and lock yourself up in a room full of suits. I was appalled. I am still appalled. I'm appalled that you can't make a decision because, oh no, sorry, we've got policies and procedures in place, which means that we can't actually do that. We, you know, that's contrary to something that's been... You know, why can't someone pound a fucking desk and say, enough, enough? If, if ECAN were to say, you know what, um, we might have to give the consent to that water bo bottling company in um, Belfast, but we're not going to. Take us to court. We don't care. We don't care. You're not going to get it. People would be in the streets going, celebrating. Be like v VJ Day or whatever the hell they called it. Hmm. People would be rejoicing because that's what we want. We want... We put people in positions to be leaders, so bloody lead, don't be sheep, you know? So with your parents, did they give you a love of nature, or did, were, they, were they neoliberals? Well, well, actually, interestingly enough, my dad was a fitter and turner who worked at the New Zealand Railways, mm -hmm. and his father was a pattern maker, my brothers are boiler makers, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a gardener. So you've got a, you've got a practical background and a horticultural background, which kind of leads into what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I spoke to some planning, final year planning students at Lincoln last year. The one thing I said to them was, I'm highly respected, or was, as a planner at Environment Canterbury. I have no planning credentials whatsoever. Okay. I'm a great planner because I'm a gardener. Well, here's a kind of natural segue. When you look at politics at the moment and the green side of things, what they're achieving, the tangible wins that we see aren't very many. Even Extinction Rebellion, it's kind of like parting the seas with your finger. It doesn't last long. Yeah, when I look back at the time of the Springbok tour, the boomers, half of this country, were out on the street offering themselves up for a rest over the Springbok tour. Where were you? Do you remember that? Um, were you born? <laughs> yes, I was. So I was 21, 81. Um, got, I was a, I'm a rugby league player, so mm. I vehemently opposed to rugby anyway. <laughs> um, no, no, serious. Uh, yeah. To me, a rugby union was about police officers being um, in, in teams and referees and linesmen and if you were drunk driving and you're a rugby boy for Marist you right well give us your keys or get home with you and don't drive anywhere else if you're a rugby league player for Eddington or Wollstone or Hallswell or Hornby right you're coming with me really? and, and, yeah, absolutely and I can remember being at the Hallswell Tavern the night before the uh, Lancaster Park Test Match and some people from Lincoln coming in and going, oh, rugby, rugby, and I remember going, oh, fuck off. No way you and of course, that was it. <laughs> you know, oh, bloody... <laughs> but, and, and even, I remember being on one of the marches, walking down Cashel Street. Now, there were elderly women, there were young people. It was a diversity of our society. Walking past Fergie's Bar and there were people dressed in rugby um, jerseys and ties and stuff, Making, like just taking the piss out of people. And someone next to me, never knew who it was, 
just said, let's fucking get them. And we did. We remember just pummeling into these rugby people outside because it was just like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it might have been an opportunity to do that, isn't it? You know? yeah. But it also was like rugby owes, rugby's got a big debt to pay back to the community. So you have the, the Greens and Labour flowed into government on a tsunami of promises. And I'm still waiting for those promises to be fulfilled. I'm getting a little bit, bit angry because every compromise we make, we lose something. Do you have any feelings about that? I do. I mean, like most people, I'm sort of disappointed that, uh, for me, I, I'm fortunate in my life. I'm not a wealthy man by any stretch, but I don't have a problem with the capital gains tax, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think that... Um, we have to get it in our head that we have to share wealth. It's about sharing, or opportunity more. It's not so much wealth, it's about sharing opportunity for people. Yeah. It's about being a community. I'm not a communist, I'm a communityist. That's my problem with the world today. We're becoming nasty, and a lot of it's to do with the fact that the way that the world runs now is we've become, we isolate people. So it's that divide and conquer. And the one thing that Māori have in this country at the moment is us trying to hang on for all dear life to that whole iwi, runanga, hapu, extended sort of community. Okay. And we're doing everything we can to, to, to destroy that as well, you know? Uh, you and I have a particular common enemy. It's one of the things that first attracted me to you, this Nick Smith. And I heard that you once challenged him to go three rounds in a boxing ring. Was that yeah, true? Um, I challenged him to a fist fight, yes. Yeah. And did, what did he say? Um, well, his office said that he would not be commenting. However, he wanted on record that the National Party had done more for fresh water than the other government. <laughs> Which made, and I went, I've, that, you know, yeah. you fucking liar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, Greg, Greg, tell me about your tattoos then. Well, I only have a couple, but one of them is uh, the Spirit of Freedom. And I got that in 1984, I think, uh, which is a little bit after when Bobby Sands had died. 26-year-old um, Irishman who was the first of the hunger strikers to die. Um, there's an inner thing in every man, do you know this thing, my friend, it has withstood the blows of a million years and will do so to the end. It lights the dark of my prison cell, it thunders forth its might. It is that undauntable thought, my friend, the thought that says I'm right. Okay, so why do you have that tattoo? I have that tattoo because a 26-year-old man with the convictions of his beliefs died in, by hunger strike for for his people. And people go, oh, martyrdom, what's its worth? But what Bobby Sands did was he humanised people who were being incarcerated for wanting an imperial nation out of their country. There are days I hear the lagoon breathing. People think I'm a lunatic. I hear it breathe. And there are times I walk underneath it, I might be checking some traps, and the hairs on the back of your neck will sort of come up and you'll just feel energy around you. And, and, and sometimes I go, it's only me. Um, you know, there'll be fantails or bellbirds sort of traveling with me. And it's a living thing that makes me feel so good. So you have a sense of place? Yes, I do. This is it, yeah. And I never realized that Mokateri, Mokateri, Mount Grey was my mountain because I'm born in South Brighton. But when I stand on the beach in South Brighton, I see Mokateri when I look down to the, to the north here. So it's my mountain.